the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPGMGP. Ain't no party like an adventuring party. Welcome to the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPGMGP, your one-stop shop for everything RPG Maker. This is Marvix, a.k.a. Cody, and with me today are the Red Mage. Hello, hello. And after a long absence, back with a vengeance, the one and only Blue Sky Robin. Yo. Got some great news. Uh, Yanfly has released a couple new tips and tricks. Uh, he's made Poach from Final Fantasy Tactics. So if you use a Poach skill on a certain enemy, they will give you an item for killing them. It's not Mug, technically. It's more uh, hunting monsters to gain items, a la Monster Hunter. Yeah, which I think is a really, really cool mechanic. I like that much better than the general just killing enemies and... <laughs> taking their their body parts like in in an unpracticed way to forge because usually that's you know for making weapons and armor so I, I like the poaching when they have to have skill to do it yeah as opposed to just killing twenty five bunnies waiting for one to drop its tail right ex- exactly exactly man mm-hmm. I'm just give me a rabbit's foot already man <laughs> well mm. if you hit it with this special club technique you can get this this fur whatever. <laughs> See, then you can knock it out, and then skin it, and then not just cut it to ribbons with your claymore. <laughs> Man, if you hit the rabbit with a claymore, there would be no usable inside. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. The rabbit would just explode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Speaking of rabbits exploding, how's Yanfly doing? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, that, that's another thing, that the recent update to MV apparently broke a lot of people's uh, scripts. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. That's why mm-hmm. I don't use MV. That, I mean, that's not why, but I'm glad I don't. Because <laughs> of that. Liar. <laughs> Man, that reminds um, me of, uh, like, the United States Navy bought a gajillion PS3s and then installed Linux on them because it was cheaper to have a super cluster of PS3s than to hire a company to build a supercomputer for them. And then, later, Sony patched out the ability to install another operating system, so they, they can't ever update these things ever again, or they're going to lose the ability to run Linux on them. Oh, jeez. <laughs> you think that would make, like, a very special exception, you know, because it's the government, but... <laughs> nah. No. It's for military purposes, you say to Japan, who has no military other than for defense. <laughs> Yeah, oh, wait, wait, who defends Japan? Oh, right, hmm, we do. Right. <laughs> Man, I don't even fucking know anymore. <laughs> no, that, that, was, that was part of the treaty is, okay, Japan, you're surrendering, and you go, don't get to have an army. We will have an army for you. <laughs> yep, yep. We, we right. are Team America World Police. Yep. And now that they've destroyed our PS3 super cluster, we're completely screwed. <laughs> This was their plan all along. The other tips and tricks I was really looking forward to talking about is dramatic entry. So if you utilize enough of Yanfly's scripts, you can have a scene where you have two characters fighting and then the rest of the party runs in and then the enemies hop to their positions and the battle starts. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, that's a tutorial or an actual plugin? If you use four or five plugins, you can make dramatic entry possible. Oh, Um, so it's a tutorial, yeah. Yeah, I think That's pretty so, cool. I think there was someone else who also, well, not as dramatic as that, but like something similar. Because like when the battle starts, it zooms in on the hero party, then zooms in on the enemy party, and when it zooms in, they each do like a pose or whatever, and then the <laughs> battle starts. <laughs> uh, no, this one is about uh, there's no there's no transition from the cutscene to the battle. Like the battle just literally starts. Um, oh, okay. That's much different from it then. <laughs> it's pretty neat, though. I, I, I like that idea, too. And and it's one of the reasons I'm sad. <laughs> don't use MV to, to make cool stuff like that. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Don't worry, man. If, if we know Yanfly, he'll probably patch all his 120-plus uh, plugins within a week. Oh, yeah, probably. And die. I, well, I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, after he unbreaks them to be compatible with MV's new patch, for sure. Yeah. All right. So, Robin, you've been absent for a while. Uh, was there anything from the previous podcast you wanted to talk about? Pass. 
No. <laughs> I did that two months ago. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh, jeez. Talked about see, heroes, heroes was, villains. You talked about heroes, villains. I forgot what came before that. Crap. <laughs> yeah, other, other uh, yeah, stuff. Crap. I, I wanted to talk about one guy in specific from Wild Arms 4, but like... I don't know. It's kind of spoilery. Well, and, but, uh, like, it's been out for long enough by now that uh, I don't. I don't think it really counts as spoiler material by this point. Sephiroth so... kills Luke's father, Rosebud. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker. Uh, okay. In Wild Arms Four, there were your four party members, and then there was the big bad guy team, who was like a total of ten guys, I guess. Basically, Evil Justice League. <laughs> okay. Because they all have superpowers, and they're all, like, something Red Mage hates, I think. It's like, oh, we hate war, so we destroy war and some... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to, to save the world from war, we'll destroy it. Something like that. I wasn't entirely clear. <laughs> That's wild arms for you, to be honest. <laughs> anyway... Your hero party is going around, and then they help a guy named Gon. He was basically a homeless guy. The first time you meet him, he got lost in the forest, and he's fucking hungry. So you help him out, and then you lead him to the next city. And then, like, you meet him from time and time, and he's such a loser when you meet him. <laughs> but, like, he tries to help you out, and he's a nice guy. And then every so often, you get a glimpse of the evil villain party, like, as their bosses get defeated and killed one by one. They're talking about their plans of getting a prison island and then weaponizing it. Okay. Near the end of the game, you're supposed to, like, infiltrate the prison island with a super weapon. It's described as a super weapon that shoots 10 really powerful defense missiles. So everyone has this great idea to take this airplane because there's no other way to get to the island in a fast time. On their way to the base with the airplane, they take this train. And this train, of course, belongs to the Evil Justice League. All the enemy soldiers are there. You fight everyone. You get to the final room, and you fucking meet the badass hidden member of the Justice League, Gone. <laughs> yeah, the, the homeless guy you were fighting. He's a fucking badass, apparently. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that idiot you know, that you held at the beginning of the game ends up being the final boss. Yeah, yeah, and he's... No, 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 he's not the final boss. He's there to stop you. But at the start, he's like, okay, look, kid. I don't want to fight you, but you're in over your head if you're trying to stop us. <laughs> He's basically asking you to leave and just let them do their thing. Right? But like, no, we're stupid children and we have to fight you. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty far for the course. So like, remember how I said everyone had fucking superpowers in this Evil Justice League? Mm -hmm. Gon's powers, apparently, he can wield the fucking strongest revolvers ever. And like, it seems like a kind of a lame power, though. Yeah, like, I can yeah, wield they... these two guns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can wield these two guns. They fucking hurt like hell. <laughs> Just to prove his point, at the start of the battle, he uses up all his bullets to almost kill everyone, then reloads it. <laughs> <laughs> That's that actually kind true. of a, almost like a neat battle intro thing, though, yeah, to, like kind of like demonstrate his ability and then you have like the time to recover and then actually you know battle start yeah yeah and the way you fight him is he has 12 bullets if you can get past his 12 bullets he'll let you through because he really doesn't <laughs> want to fight you guys <laughs> so rather than like a like an anti-hero he's kind of like an anti-villain in a way yeah, like, he doesn't want to fight you, but his resolve is wavering, so after the fight, you convince him to move aside, and, like, you finally get to the plane, you're on your way to the prison place. They decide, you know what, let's just shoot all ten rockets at that little plane. <laughs> that's, that's a little overkill. We're gonna yeah, kill you yeah. dead, son. And then, so who fucking shows up but fucking gone in his own airplane, and he's, I said ten missiles, right? He shoots down two of them fucking jumps out, shoots two more with his guns, and then he stays afloat with just his guns. <laughs> Is he, like, yeah, firing yeah. at the ground to stay up? Yes, that's apparently what fucking happens. <laughs> and then the last one he runs out of bullets for, so he throws his guns down, fucking punches it. 
and then he gives his speech about how children are the future. <laughs> I really like Khan, by the way. <laughs> Fuck. Sounds very anime. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. fucking stupid, but I, I love stupid shit. Yeah. We should probably do something about, like, side villains in a future cast, because since you brought up Evil Justice League, I immediately thought of the Axum Rangers from Super Mario RPG and how I... Hell to- yeah. I totally forgot to bring them up. Ah. <laughs> uh. Yeah, well, we'll like recurring villains. Okay. Yeah, side villains. That'd, that'd be an interesting thing, too, because they're sometimes more endearing than the actual villain. Looking at you, yeah, yeah. Gilgamesh from Final Fantasy V. <laughs> the are cool. Yeah, I think it's because, like, with the side villains, you see them more often, and there's more character right. development. Yeah. As opposed to uh, you're knocking on the, the final boss's door, like, hey, I'm here to kill you now. What's good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Drake, a lord from Dragon Quest 1, and they're like, yeah, he's right over that river, but uh, you'll get to him eventually. And then you talk to him for like three seconds, and that's the whole exposition he gets. Yeah, thinking about that now, the Dragon Quest series is kind of stupid on its face. Like, there's a bad guy, and he's probably doing evil stuff, and he's going to sit there for the next three months waiting for you to come over. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Isn't it weird that his castle is just like like, a stone's throw away from the starting town. Like, yeah, it has an impassably poisonous swamp that's, like, around it, and then, like, all the monsters there are super difficult to beat uh, if you're just walking there. But, like, it's so close to the starting place. I think that was done to give you a visual idea of, like, oh, there's where I'm supposed to go, and I can't reach there. So the game sets you up making you angry, like, I want to get to this castle. I want to get to this castle. How the hell do I get to this castle? And then finally, 20 hours later or whatever, you finally get there, and you're like, okay, I'm going to kick the shit out of this guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess that yeah, works. It's just kind of like a... Life farming later, I now have this axe. I'm going to kick your ass. Hell yeah. It just kind of works as a tantalizing meat on a hook, really. Just a very right. visual cue right from the beginning. But anyway, all right, we're getting back into film, so you need to stop. <laughs> all right, perfect. Let's get into today's subject. Uh, This isn't just about the hero of the story, it's about the hero's party members. And just like how the protagonist of a game can range from being a blank shell to a diverse and subtle character, so can the party members. And I think it's a real important trick to write partners well, because you want them to be endearing but not overwhelm the plot or take too much attention. Um, Right. I grew up with the old-school RPGs, you know, like the Final Fantasy Legend uh, games especially, and you had four characters. Their backstories were either non-existent or very bare-bones. You chose what they were, you named them, and you sent them on their way. And that, to me, was kind of like playing with Legos. You have these people, and you can either imagine that they're you or that they're one of your friends, and they're like toys, and you just send them through this world to experience it. In later years, you now have, like, you know, the Bioware and Bethesda RPGs, where the side characters are very well written to complement what usually are blank shell heroes. So, gentlemen, how much personality do you prefer in your party members? See, I'm part of that old school group, man. I, I'm i a really big fan of the very blank slate characters. Because then, cause then you get to, like, come up with stuff as you're playing through the game and, like, and with the characters, because there's one time in this Final Fantasy One, I, I know it's like you're, you know, you don't really have like a main character. You've got four blank slate characters. You name them, you give them a job, you send them on your way. Um, but there was one time, and this was when I was like really young and I was really terrible at the game. Three of my characters were dead. <laughs> I didn't have enough money to revive anybody. Um, and the only character I had alive was was the Black Mage, who is, you know, pretty shitty by himself without <laughs> anybody to tank it. But I managed to, just through like sheer luck and, and force of, of of playing, kill enough things to like to revive people. So like in my mind, there's this narrative going about this guy who always depended on everybody else for survival, and now he's got to be the one to step up and, and help you know the rest of the party. <laughs> he's the dark mage. He's the bad you know the evil wizard, but he has to be the the one doing the good deed. And it was just it was very interesting to me at like eight years old <laughs> to be to be doing something like that so 
for me, I prefer Blank Slate. Now, not to say that well-written characters aren't fun, but I, I like to, to, to self-insert, I guess, a lot. Yeah. yeah. That reminds me of a playing Final Fantasy Tactics, which is largely in the same vein. I didn't know about <laughs> recruiting during my first run-through of the game, so I just had, you know, people with, with all their names or whatever. And I will never forget Cedric. Cedric <laughs> was the man. He ended up, uh, he probably saved more than a couple people on the playthrough, because that's why I remember his name. He also became a dragoon, and he killed the crap out of people. Hell yeah. Yeah, so I, I totally feel you there, because, you know, because they start as blank, but you're still controlling them, they're definitely not you, so you're free to imbue them with whatever you want. And if Cedric becomes a hero, great. If he becomes the clumsy guy that keeps missing his attacks and dies, well, fuck you, Cedric. Goodbye. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I see. One of my early experiences wasn't with blank slate hero characters, kind of. Like, one of the major RPGs I played early on was, like, Legend of Ligaia. And the way that starts is, like, you're one guy... And he's kind of a blank slate. He doesn't really talk. But then the other two characters that you recruit is like, one's a girl from a mountain that was literally raised by a wolf. And oh, the yeah. other's a stuck-up monk. <laughs> like, yeah. So, and then when you get to them, like, their story is totally 100% defined. Because, like, oh, no, my wolf mother's died. <laughs> but, like, like or, or, like, Fuck, the monastery got attacked and like my my training brother betrayed me. Gotta fucking kick his ass. Yeah, that's true. Now thinking back on it, yeah, the main character really didn't have like a whole lot of just story. He was just kinda like, I'm I'm here and this thing happened to me. And then the other two have like actual like, like driving forces behind them. Like, no 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 no, there's totally a reason for your guy to do stuff because it's like Oh, you got the power to drive away the monsters from this uh, magic thing. So I guess go travel the world and activate all the magic things. It seems like once you get into the Super Nintendo era and forward, the RPG genre tried to put more personality into all the characters. And even with Final Fantasy VI, every single character has a tragic backstory. And that's not hyperbole. They all have backstories and they're all freaking tragic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I feel yep. like mm. uh, as JRPGs progress, you know, you have like <laughs> the, the classics on PS One. You have like Lunar. You have Grandia. Then you have like Skies of Arcadia, which continues in that same vein with uh, very detailed protagonists. And then once we start getting into the later era, you know, like PS Two, and then up into PS Three, and and nowadays, I feel like the plots of anime, or bleh, the plots of JRPGs have gotten to anime. You know, they're, the characters no yeah. longer have the nuance of the innocence that they once had. They're just kind of tropish and uh, digestible. That's that's fair. Um, I, I can definitely see that. I mean, of course, you've got, you know, the games, like, I'm trying to think of one. Like, this guy kind of breaks the mold a little bit. Pretty much anything by, by them, NIS kind of breaks the mold a little bit. Because that's kind of that's kind of what they do, but but yeah, you, it, it, they and at the same time, it's hard to say though because it's also possible that just because now that we're older and have experienced all these like the tropes that were there before, we didn't notice them as tropes so much, and now that we're you know more more experienced in in character writing, just kind of by default by being exposed to it, it's just like oh that's that's the straight man, <laughs> that's the funny guy, ladies man. You know, it's just easier to kind of pick them out as they're introduced. Mm. So, yeah, because you know, when you're a kid, you you don't. It uh, again, like what I said, I think during the heroes one, you go from absorbing to interpreting as you get older. So if you see the funny guy, you know he's going to do funny guy things for the whole rest of the game. Uh, right. As a as a kid, you're still expecting them to do something else because as a kid, you have no, <laughs> you have no idea, like. Oh man, she went behind her hands. Is there is her face still there? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a little bit of an extreme example, but yeah, I can uh, I can get behind that. It's, it's the whole peekaboo thing. There's no there's no tangibility. You don't you don't realize it because it's not in front of you. Right. Exactly. No object permanence. I think is the the official words for it. But uh, but yeah, and and it's an interesting thing with with the side characters too. Um where they kind of just take 
take this different transformation, especially with, with Western RPGs, which we kind of talked about earlier. Like, as opposed to the JRPGs in the Western end, because generally Western RPGs gives you the blank slate character, like completely blank slate, they have they, they need to be more interactive to kind of bounce your character off of so you can give your own character a personality. But if they were all just kind of those very, you know, one-sided, tropish people, then there wouldn't be as much to bounce your character off of. So there wouldn't be as much, like, content there. Yeah, I believe Adam brought this up when we were just kind of talking, not in a podcast, but just because we live in the same town. Uh, the side characters for Western RPGs tend to be more complicated because they have protagonists that are nothing. Like, they're supposed to be you, and... I think it helps the game tremendously to have those side characters that are detailed because if you're in a Western RPG, you want to be involved in the world. You want to, you're you there to soak it all in as an observer, so having these complex characters helps add to the experience. Right, exactly. And then whereas in, you know, like in the JRPG, the main character will actually usually have some kind of personality. It's usually just, you know... A trope in of itself, bouncing off of other trope-like side characters, which, like you said, is more digestible, but is entertaining in its own right. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, if you play Western RPGs, you're, you're always going to get different characters when, when you play any given Western RPG. And, you know, you'll have a funny guy, but they'll have some kind of past or some kind of quirk. And then if you play a different Western RPG, the funny guy will probably be an axe murderer. You don't know. like Right. <laughs> or he's, he's being the funny guy to mask the tragic, you know, thing that <laughs> happened to him when he was younger, which ties, you know, into either a side plot or maybe even part of the main plot. You know, basically like, you know, Inigo Montoya almost. Or the... so he really, wasn't a real funny guy, but same, same idea. Or like the comedian in Watchmen. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I think that Japanese RPGs don't ever get that complex. Because the most complex I've ever seen them be is probably Final Fantasy Tactics or FF6, where they went out of their way to make the characters complex. Most of the time, mm -hmm. it's uh, you have your, your cute little girl, and and the only time they ever subvert the trope of the cute little girl is when she's the mean cute little girl. Right. Like, <laughs> I, I think that... Japan lacks nuance. They don't understand how important it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean that might be a, a very a very valid point because I mean even even if you think back to like, you know, Final Fantasy Four, which is is my second or sometimes my first, depending on what day you ask me. Um, you know, the the main character is basically he starts as a good you know, he's a good guy. He's a dark knight, but he's generally a good guy who wants to do the right thing. That's literally all of Cecil's character. He just, he's a good guy who wants to do the right thing. Um, Kane is about the only one who has any like real depth to him at all. But then Rose is just she's the she's the white mage girlfriend. Uh, Edge is the wisecracking ladies man ninja, I guess. And then you've got the you know the little girl who I guess Rydia has a little bit of of personality, but I mean even so, she's basically the token little girl. Yeah, and 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 that's and that's all the characters are. They're, they don't have anything else to them, which is sad. <laughs> but that's it. But yeah, in, in Western RPGs, yeah, there's a lot more to them. Like one in Mass Effect, for example, one one mission. I think it's in it's either in two or three. I think it's in two. One of the loyalty missions for for Garrus. You know, he's like got this guy that he wants to kill, and you can either make the choice to let him kill him or not. And that's kind of like a pretty like dark <laughs> choice, but it but it's all about like his character growth. That's nothing to do with your main character. So it's it's just a really interesting way, like, way to uh, to look at that kind of stuff because you don't usually see those kind of side quests that fundamentally change a character in JRPGs. Yeah, and even with that quest, maybe I don't know if Garrus even has extra dialogue after you do it. So it's all it's the Suikoden style thing <laughs> where you just kind of imagine that it affected him and and it in uh, informs his later actions. Right. And that's that's a really cool trick I think Suikoden does is uh, they they introduce a character and you know maybe five of them have an actual arc, but the vast majority of them are like, "Hi, I cut off heads. Recruit, don't recruit." 
<laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's pretty Sigoten, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I found him in Suikoden 1 during, like, my third playthrough when I actually got all the 108 stars. <laughs> um, but, uh, like, so it runs the gamut there where you have, you know, people like Kirkus or Victor or Flick where they go through a whole arc and then, you know, that's cool, but then most of them are just, you know, one-shots. And what I loved about it is after the, the Elfland arc with Kirkus, I thought he was the coolest motherfucker on the planet. So <laughs> he he went in my party and he never left. And mm-hmm. playing through it again as an adult, I realized he says nothing after Elfland. <laughs> nothing. Everything I thought was cool about him was it came out of here. It came out of my noggin. <laughs> yeah, sound that like sounds about right. Game all right. Yep. Yep. But that's it's just very interesting how how things are handled that way. I mean, we, I mean, when you go into a, I mean, I guess if you don't know anything about them, then you kind of have a whole another thing you're looking at. But if you're going into a secreting game, you're pretty much expecting just to have 108 stat blocks and a main character. You know, that's the, that's pretty much all that they're good for. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, it was kind of a non plus too because I found out that like if you find the main character's uh, old staff teacher, they can use a combination attack that hits the entire enemy party for double normal attack damage. So there's no reason to ever not use it. You can literally just break the game by going through and using that combination attack all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that and I mean and that's kind of what. I mean, what is interesting to me, and I'm going to segue into something here that's pretty similar. It starts with a poke and ends with an Amon. <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, no. it, I mean, we're talking about party composition, okay? That This is basically the stat block thing, where you can, <laughs> you can take these 700 and something, which now there's more, of course, of the new generation. Yep. But that mix and match, create... Them. Yeah, whatever party you want. It's like Final Fantasy One, on the most crack you can possibly stick into something. <laughs> you have an adventure, and you can compose your party of seven hundred and you know fifty some different classes. Basically, it, I mean, obviously, you know, you guys don't have any personality. They've got a nature, which means absolutely nothing besides stats. They've got EVs, which means absolutely nothing but stats. They've got IVs, which means no- absolutely nothing but stats. But it kind of falls into what I was, you know, what I was talking before, where I like that blank slate. So I can have my guy who is pretty cool, and he beats the crap out of everything, and I can give him a badass personality <laughs> in game while I'm playing it and be a role playing <laughs> loser because that's what I do. That's what I enjoy. <laughs> but but the fact that you can do that with those kind of games, that's what it's about. It's about your team members. And that's like the the truest party composition, in my opinion, that that you've got out there. Hmm. So, but that's just me on that. <laughs> yeah, Pokemon was weird for me because, like, I always felt like you had to have your starter in your team. So it was like really weird for me. Hmm. Like, any of I you mean, guys do that? No, dude, I I I always well, okay, except with the exception of X and Y, that's the only time I've I've actually kept my starter. I always ditch him for something else. Uh. Be, only because he's so they're so much more stronger in like the early to mid game than anything else that's out there. It kind of gives you an unfair advantage. Um so I always go usually like I would ditch it for like in the original games I'd get a Nidoran or a, a uh, Mankey as my starter. Nidoran's quote unquote, the bomb. dude, he is too, <laughs> and I mean, which Nido King kind of makes the game unfair in his own way, but <laughs> but that's that's kind of what I do. But I can definitely see that because yeah, having the start of the kind of like give it to you, it's like the only like plot relevant thing that you get monster. So I can see that where you kind of felt like you were forced to have him. Like yeah, yeah, it it didn't really occur to me that you could just actually just put him in your. PC and never get him out again. Because, <laughs> like, cause like, I was like, okay, this is my Pikachu. I'm going to take care of this guy. Fucking kill everyone with him. Yeah. <laughs> Man. That's actually... Uh, th- I love that. Because um, I, I got the red version way back in the day. And I got Charmander. And Charmander was a boss. Because I got him up to, like, level 60, because I only used him, Vaporeon, and Pidgeotto up to the Elite Four, and then I had to restart. (laughs) 
Because <laughs> uh, the anime lied to me. I shouldn't have replaced Flamethrower with Fire Spin because I ended up being totally fucking useless when I got to Lorelei. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got screwed by the anime. Yeah, uh, but anyhow, that ended up coming back because two, three years ago when X and Y came out, I got Chespin. And Chespin was cool, like he's this little round chestnut dude, so I named him Jables after Jack Black and Tenacious D. Hell yeah. <laughs> he's just a fat, jolly little shit. And then I find out later you get to choose a starter from Red, Blue, and Yellow. I'm like, oh my god, and so I got Charmander, of course. Mm -hmm. And... uh Everything from fourth grade came rushing back because I had Charmander again, and it was my old starter with my new starter, and they started working together like they were brothers. Like, they were brothers to me. That's what it felt like. Right. They both reached level 36 and evolved into their final forms in the same battle, and I know that uh. that is just... It's completely useless. It doesn't mean anything to anyone except me. I thought it was the most special moment in my entire history of playing Pokemon. No, definitely. I can I can definitely see something like that. I, that's that kind of thing is really is really fucking cool when it happens cuz you get to input so much into the game. Um like there was one where I did an egg lock which basically you get six mystery eggs from like people on the internet just randomly and whatever you hatch out of that that's what you have to use, which mm. is it's, it's really fun. Um but I ended up with a Magby who had Thunder Punch and an Ella kid who had Fire Punch. <laughs> so, and, in my, and they were from different trainers, so it was completely like, coincidental. But in my head, brothers, actual, like from the same family, brothers. And so they, they pretty much just sold the rest, or duoed, I guess, the rest of the game for me because that was awesome. <laughs> and I will never have another experience like that again, and that makes me sad. But it was just, it was so perfect, and I, and I loved it. Yeah, I think most people experience something like that when they're racing a Magikarp or an Abra for the first time. Because mm -hmm. they're completely fucking useless. You have to go and do all this extra crap and switch them out. Or at least back in the day, you had to, you know, keep printing them out, switching them out, and doing the other stuff. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah. Yep. My first and they'll actually like evolve. That, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, my first Gardevoir was like that, too. It was like, fuck. It's amazing. Yeah, when, when it finally, like, actually become, goes from being useless to, like, probably the strongest member of your team, yeah. <laughs> okay, alright, so to, to, get off, to get off Pokemon... Yeah, yeah, we don't want Pokemon, to. guys, right? Dude, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, okay. I, I could talk about it all day, <laughs> but... Alright, to get off of it, um, one, one other game I wanted to talk about, too, which we did mention last podcast, is Lisa... Because that also has a game where you can kind of mix and match party members, but they actually go like a little step further. Um, and most of the characters have like a little bit of, you know, story or something before you recruit them. But what they did, what I thought was really cool, is in the victory screen of each battle, they all have like something that they say. And so as, as you like win more battles, you kind of get like a little bit more bits and pieces of everybody's personality. Even if it's not much, it's it's still something. And I think that was really just a very nice touch to give personality to characters who don't have a whole lot on their own. Yeah. Uh, some of the later Tales games did that, too, where people would understand who was healing them or they would have special little victory uh, animations if they were in the party with another certain party member. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, uh, and, and what's... Uh, Fighting games, I mean, it's not real RPG, but, like, fighting games, especially, like, uh, Tech and Tag Tournament, well, did, did stuff like that, the original and the and the new one, where if you had, like, both the guys who did Taekwondo together, like, they would both do, like, the same kata set <laughs> at the intro, so it was pretty cool. Um, but, yeah, and then Final Fantasy X-2, which is the best form of the ATB ever to exist. <laughs> really? Uh, uh, it's it's really good. You can actually like interrupt enemy actions and stuff by hitting them as they're doing their animation. <laughs> it's really good. It's like that. If the plot to that game was worth anything, it would probably be my favorite. Like, <laughs> I, I shit you not. Nah. <laughs> but but like the characters talk to each other while they fight. So like if you have, you know, Yuna, attack, and then Riku comes in right after. For example, she'll say like. Thanks for setting them up, Yuna, and then and then attacks. Like they they talk and and jo joke and jibe each other while they're fighting, and it's so fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
going back to the game is garbage. <laughs> Going back to fighting games for just one second, they did something similar in Marvel vs. Capcom 3, and I thought it was so cool, because, you know, you have a couple members of the X-Men in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And most people, you know, if you if you tag out, they'll say Wolverine. But if you have Storm and you tag out into Wolverine, she'll say Logan, which is his actual oh, name. Cool. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That is cool. I, I like those little touches like that. That give, you know, that just give, gives more to the interaction than just... You know, just pushing a button. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like how if you set like Phoenix Wright's voice to Japanese, they'll actually call him Narhodo. <laughs> <laughs> What's like that? instead of instead that, of that, Wright, because Narhodo was his Japanese name. Yeah, so if you set up, yeah, like if you if you give him the the Japanese voice and like when they tag out to him, they'll actually call him by his Japanese name rather by his English name. <laughs> yeah, and fun fact, I think Narhodo means. Ah, I see. Yeah, so, something along that. Something well, like that, those yeah. Lines. Something, something really lame and punny, because that's the entire Phoenix Wright series, which is why it's awesome. It's all <laughs> fun, yeah. It's great. The Phoenix Wright anime is going to be really interesting, because they're planning on doing a straight dub, which means they're going to use his Japanese name and not Phoenix Wright. Hmm. That is interesting. I will... It would still like, work. I, I, I mean, it'll still work. I just, I'm very, like, I don't understand what, I guess, I guess pretty much if you're a fan of Phoenix, right, you know enough about it to know, like, his, all the Japanese stuff to it, but it's still just, I don't understand why they wouldn't just use his, his English name. I know, like, this is the problem of doing a dub so well that, you know, now the original's coming back in. Freaking. Like, with the original Sailor Moon, like, Serena and Darian, that's what they'll be to me. But then, like, in the manga, they're referred to as Usagi and Mamoru, even in English. I'm like, oh, okay, so I guess I, I had a very limited experience. Everyone <laughs> assumes that they're not the cheesy romance novel names that I thought they were. Right. <laughs> Don't worry, Ace Attorney still takes place in America to me. <laughs> <laughs> Eat your hamburgers, Apollo. <laughs> they they left that hamburgers in the sub though, uh, because my wife watches it and I watch over her shoulder because I, I still love the series. But yeah, Maya still is a fan of hamburgers, and I'm pretty sure in the Japanese it's ramen. Like eighty percent sure. <laughs> I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Any, but uh, it, it, that's I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, when we're talking about characters, uh, so those little touches are really nice. Uh, but they would not be available with blank slate parties like with the early uh, Final Fantasy games. Uh, is there a certain mood that you have to be in to enjoy one over the other? Because I feel like if you have the Suikoden style where some are super fleshed out and some literally just exist, there becomes a mental disconnect between how much imagination you're willing to put in versus you know, how much the game is giving you. Yeah, that's that's fair. I can't I can't really argue with that. Um, I mean, to be honest, when I when I play, like for example, the West the Western RPGs, Baldur's Gate, Mass Effect, um, and any of those, like I'm I'm looking pretty much just at the side characters. Um, I don't because I don't really care, the, <laughs> which is kind of weird. I don't actually <laughs> care anything about the main character at all. Like. I can't I can't self insert into them because they do things that I wouldn't do. Like I I've, I've played D&D for so long that I can't just go with the standard path options. I have I have to like think what's this really kooky way that I could approach this situation cuz that's just kind of how <laughs> how I do. So it's hard for me to self insert into the into the main the main blank slate characters. Um, but I do find it really interesting just to watch how all the side characters grow and change and evolve as as the games go on. So for me, it kind of depends on if I'm more in a in an interactive mood or if I'm more just looking to, I guess, play an interactive movie because that's what a lot of the newer games are, um, where you just kind of push A through the cutscenes and or they've got voiceovers just kind of listen to things as they play out and then oh you got some gameplay oh okay more cutscenes and you know just kind of sit back and watch, which drives me nuts but that's you know but I digress but I. I guess yeah. If I'm in more of a lazy mood, I prefer the western end where all the all the side characters are more fleshed out and there's more things to them. Because then I don't have to think about it as part uh, as opposed to like you know creating things as I'm playing the characters. That's fair. 
Oh man, that reminds me of side characters from other games. Uh, like, since we're talking about RPGs, like Atelier Iris, I think. Mm -hmm. It's one of the Altaria games. And I think those games have, like, really neat side characters. Like, they do. most of them are quest givers, but, like, you meet them often because, like, your starting hub is, like, just the one town. I'm, I might be mixing up games here, but, like, there's one point where you're doing a quest for one shopkeeper. Their quest line is you gather these kinds of weird parts and then you help them make it. And then. When your when your party eventually asks what all this stuff is for, it's they're like, "Oh, this is for, I want to forget the death of my loved one or something." And then like the very end of that quest line is you have to meet her at the grave of their loved one. And then like it turns out like they didn't actually drink the thing that they made, so they decided to give it back and then give you something extra for the trouble, but, like, it's really emotional when you get to that point. Yeah, that's a lot of thought to put into just, like, a random quest NPC, but a, a lot of the those games, um, what's this other one I've got? I've got it on my shelf. Um, Art and Alico are, they're almost, like, half RPG, half visual novel. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Be be because most of the characters will usually have that same full body sprite, and you can, you know, romance a lot of them most of the time, and just <laughs> and there's just a lot of a lot of that to it. But uh, but yeah, it, those those games do put a lot of effort for JRPGs into the side characters, and I do like that. Yeah, if we want to segue a little bit here, um, earlier Red Mage, you said like you don't care about the main character in most of the it, time. In the Western RPGs, yeah, not so much. All right. Yeah, I have a, an anime on my shelf. It's called Comic Party Revolution, and it's based off a dating sim. So you have all these cute girls with these nice personalities, and you have this dude who's just kind of there, and, you know, they have to make manga for the big doujin festival, which name mm -hmm. escapes me. But mm -hmm. so all the girls, you know, they have to keep getting the dude involved in everything they're doing because, you know, it's based off a dating sim or whatever. But... If you didn't know it was based off a dating sim, this guy has no personality. So it could either you think they're all in love with him, or he could just be the autistic friend that they keep involving in their activities. Like, hey, we're gonna draw stuff now. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Oh god, uh, it, that's funny. So, so how do you like your mate? Wait, I don't know if you you talked about this before, but do you like them blank slated or like with some personality in it or whatever? Uh, for for me, if if the whole party is blank slate, that's fine. that's better for me. If some, if one of the or one or two of the characters has personality, the main character better have their own. I'm I I, I was I don't remember what cast it was before, but I'm kind of an all or nothing kind of guy. I think it was voice acting I was talking about before. All voice acted or not at all. Um, and personalities is kind of the same way. If everybody better have their own personality, or everybody better be blank slate, and I can put my own personality into them. Uh, that's fair, I guess. Yeah, it keep, um, keeps things simple. Uh, yeah, uh, like for example, a recent a recent game, uh, uh, and of course the name just escaped me. Um, it's on the DS. It's mostly the dungeon crawling. You draw the map as you go. Atrian Odyssey. Yeah. Yes. Atrian <laughs> Odyssey. Those but games those you don't have. Blank slate, right? Yes, they're all blank slate characters. You basically just choose a bunch of classes and a bunch of characters. You name them. And you just go, and I like that because then it's the same kind of thing. It's like you know, old school Final Fantasy One, where I can give each of these people their own personalities just based on the roles that they fulfill. Yeah, and you can reproduce those situations where it's just the black mage alive, and you have to get the hell out of the dungeon. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which sadly I haven't haven't had that experience because the games are. I mean, they're they're not easy, but I'm so much better at games now than I was when I was that age, <laughs> that I don't run into those situations. Hmm. Yeah, because I guess for me, like, having blank slate characters is, like, a little too weird for me, because I guess mm -hmm. I started with, like, presets. Right. Like, I tried I tried to play a dungeon crawly game once, and, like, you had six members, three in the front, three in the back, and, like, you had, you, all you had to do was pick their race and their class, and like, yeah, that was basically it. 
all the all the wizards were overpowered once you had enough levels for the spells. <laughs> yep. But like, yeah, it was like really hard to get behind them for me. Uh, no, and I can and I can definitely see that too. I'm just I I started with blank slates, so that's what I, I like the most. Yeah, that's something I should have covered in that last podcast too. Is uh, roguelikes because roguelikes are in that same vein of you can choose what they are, and they don't have to be you, but they can be. It's like, I'm going to be an elf ranger, I'm going to be a troll berserker, my name's going to be Steve, and then he dies, and so you make Steve 2 to avenge him. <laughs> uh, and that's one thing that was that was actually kind of cool, uh, speaking of roguelikes, um, was Rogue Legacy, because they kind of automatically assigned a name for it, and each character that you played was like the descendant of the character that died before. So you got mm-hmm. to have like this long-running plot if you wanted to in your head yeah. as, as you went. Yeah. Uh, Actually, yeah, that does remind me. Like, like blank slate characters in long games, I can't get behind. But, like, in short games like roguelikes, I'm totally fine with whatever. Right. Like, oh, I'm Joey, the wizard. A oh, 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 super almighty, cast fireball and die. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was too close to my own blast radius. Whoops. <laughs> those, bla- those blank slates I love, They're, those are fine for me. Uh, just building a whole quest around it, because I-, I can see that now, that happened with me with Final Fantasy Legend 2, because I had to play through it six or seven times to finally beat it. You know, you step away from the game for long enough, you forget what the characters were to you, and then they're mm-hmm. back to being blank slates. Right. Ah, uh, yeah. That happens a lot with me, too. Yeah, well, Yeah. no, I could definitely see that. Whereas with, like, Lunar or, or what have you, they're the same characters they were when you turned off the game last month, and you don't really have to build anything up to it. They're just, they're still there. Yep, that's true. It would be neat, like, if you had, like, some, like, after after you load a game, like, it reminds you what happened the last time. You know what game does that? Pokemon! <laughs> <laughs> I was trying my best to not bring that up, and then you fucking did. <laughs> Last time uh, on Final Fantasy 2. Man, fuck Pokemons. Like, load the game. What happened previously? You went to the Pokemon Center. You went in the cave. You went in the Pokemon Center. You went to the cave. <laughs> you went to the Pokemon Center. And now we're here. Back in the Pokemon Center. But, I mean... And and that's kind of just because you said Final Fantasy two that just made like an interesting thing come to mind for me um, between Final Fantasies one and then two and then three like in one you know as we talked about all blanks like characters in two you've got uh, Furion you've got Leon you've got Gus and you've got Maria and they all have like personalities and they all have, well I mean as as limited as it was on the NES but they all had like their own dialogue, their own thoughts, Gus was actually, like, mentally deficient, <laughs> and and could talk to animals. But, but, like, they were all, they were all, like, their own characters, and then when you get to three, all blank slates again. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting, why they did that. Yeah, um, I think three falls into what Legend 2 did. Legend 2 is, you're all classmates, and that's basically all you get. But in Final Fantasy 3 for NES, you're all orphans. Like, Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. they they accepted that you need some sort of context, but they didn't want to give you too much. Right. And, and of course, they retconned all that with the remake. Like, everybody's got their own personality and, and their own personal plot and all that afterwards. But I, I actually, despite that's the only time I've actually beaten Final Fantasy III, I very much disliked it because my characters didn't have all the exact same experience points all the <laughs> way through the game, because you get them at different points. Um, but... It was it was just interesting seeing that because I played it, you know, back translated ROM way back when, and yeah, you you fall into the cave and you just kind of go through it as Onion Kids, and then you get you know the first crystal and then you can change classes and and that and then in, playing it on the DS, like I only started with Lunith and I was like, what is going on? <laughs> Where, where's the Final Fantasy game that I played when I was a kid? Oh wow. god! I actually uh, in Final Fantasy Legend three, they understood you know like people hate plot, so they throw you straight into a battle, um, and it's it's in a simulator at like the elder's house, so it's not a really hard battle, but it has <laughs> three of the main party members and then one guest, and this is the only battle where your fourth party member is not present. 
It's the hmm. it's the only one. Like she she comes to meet up with you after that fight, and then she's with you forever. Uh, but my last four or five playthroughs of FFL three, I purposefully throw that fight to not get the fourteen experience points that puts the other three characters above <laughs> that other one. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> like I don't have OCD, but that just it bothers the hell out of me <laughs> when all like when three of the four all are all fine. And then one one person is lagging behind or a little bit ahead. It's just like, can you, can you just not? Can you? And then you gotta like like strategically kill your party members in like the intro area so you get one and two experience to get them all evened up again. <laughs> I don't have OCD, but I have OCD. <laughs> Only when it comes to that. Only when it comes to that. Motherfucker. Yeah. So what what happens in higher up levels when like one party member dies and then like the rest of the party gets experience? Like thousands of experience. I, at yeah. that point, I just, I just, I just give up. I just deal with uh, it. <laughs> no, you. I restart the fight. Like fuck this. It okay. Yeah, it depends on where it is. Like if I just left the town and I and I get jumped and get some lucky crits. Yeah, okay, I'll restart. But if I'm like three fourths the way through a cave or I beat the boss, I'm on my way out, and that happens, and I'm just like, nah, I'm just, I've come too far. I can't, I can't backtrack that far anymore. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. You're gonna be 500 behind forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. God. I, okay, I, I kind of have this, but like, it only bothers me if they don't level up at the same time. It's like, yeah, uh, if they're like like twenty experience apart, like in the later levels, it doesn't matter because you're getting so much that twenty point deficit doesn't really change anything. But yeah, mm -hmm. I can I can see that. I guess that's why I'm fine with like the game like gives you party members one by one because it's like. Oh, it's it's a fine excuse. It's okay if they don't level up at the same time. Don't worry about it. Yeah, then it doesn't trigger anyone's OCD. Except mm. for mine. <laughs> Man, if, and, if even that triggers your OCD, I don't know what to do yeah, for you. No, yeah, no, it, it, it's it, that's all it is. That's the like the only thing that does. But but I, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um. I got a quick question. So, I haven't played the later Final Fantasies, and I know this happened in 12, and it might have happened in 10 as well. N since they introduced voice acting into the Final Fantasy series, now, even, you know, with 4, and then kind of 5, and definitely 6, and on upwards, the characters had their own backstories and personalities, but mm -hmm. now with at least 12, and probably 10, they are voiced, and people say their names out loud, so it doesn't matter what you name them, because they're always going to be called Larsa, or Titus, or what have you. Right. Or you. You. <laughs> hey, you. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, by that point, you know, like, it doesn't bother me, personally, because at that point, with these later Final Fantasies, which I guess probably really started about four is is when they you know started get, getting the characters their own personalities and that at that point because everybody has one it doesn't really bother me that they use the names out loud so it doesn't matter you know if even if you have the choice to rename them which usually you don't which is actually kind of funny because in um final fantasy 4 you in the original you know you can name your character whatever you wanted there was a little guy named naming way you could talk to to rename everybody um, but in the remake, he like he's studying to become like a, a name renamer, and so when you talk to him, he actually can't rename you because they use Cecil and Kane and Rydia, like all their actual names in the voiceovers. So he can't. He's still there. He just can't rename your characters. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. he, Why? He tries, he tries to get like a bunch of other jobs to help you out <laughs> along the way. But it was just it was just kind of a funny throwback to me, rather than just removing him entirely. He's like, Well, I guess I can't rename you and you're just kinda of like, Oh <laughs> Okay, that's not what I was expecting at all. Uh, as long as they did it in a funny way, it sounds like you enjoyed it, because otherwise I'd be like, Are you serious yeah. right now, motherfucker? Yeah, no, it was it was played off pretty humorously, and then he like I said, he does some other stuff to help you out by like giving you free items here and there as you explore dungeons, I think is his his new niche. Hmm. But uh, it's just right. yeah. Yeah, it, it's not as, as as neat, but the fact that they just left him in and then just gave him a new role to keep the voice acting intact was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, at least he still does something. Yeah. But yeah, in the later in the later ones, giving everybody a voice. Yeah, it. I mean, they all have their own characters by that point, so it's. I mean, it's fine to me. It it really doesn't bother me that much at all. 
because um, I know in ten, it's only, I'm pretty sure it's only in cutscenes where they give voices and not anywhere else, which I think is where I talked about before that really bothers me. Yeah. <laughs> there be all voice acted or not, please. Uh, how do you feel about like? Uh the XCOM reboot where you can make people however you want, but then they have a voice pack. So they can sound like gruff guy one or gruff guy two, or you can give the female voice to a male, you know, like does, because they're still technically kind of blank slates, like in final fantasy tactics, but they, they need a voice file and having to choose between only, you know, five or six or seven or eight voices. Can you still feel like they have a personality? Because with me, it, I, I do okay. I understand, you know, the disconnect. You can't pay 7,000 voice actors to do 7,000 voices for one game. Right. Yeah. I just have to make sure that I don't have, like, 12 of my friends in there because, you know, the voices are going to overlap, and then, you know, Adam's going to sound like another friend, and then it's going to get awkward. <laughs> <laughs> right. I w for me, I would actually prefer if there was, like, at least some generic voices... You know, just to make just to make it sound not awkward. I did because I did play a game like called Mugen Souls, and like you could you you had your story characters, and then you had you could make your generic ones. But like, I guess there was a glitch or something, or I don't know, because the because you can pick the Japanese voices if you're using the Japanese language, but if you're using English, those voices are not are non-existent for the generic guys. And it sounds really awkward when you sw when you swing your attacks or you do you do your mighty earth shattering attacks and then like like there's no voices at all <laughs> like not even like screaming or like ah! not even link or whatever. Yeah, no, uh. I, can, <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> um, now, one one of the earliest examples that I've got in this and is um, actually a Western RPG, uh, Neverwinter Nights, which. Being a huge D&D fan, I fucking love that game. <laughs> um, and when you, like in the base game, there's like, I think there's probably like a good 15, 20 voices, if I'm remembering right, that you can choose. And each of them like has like their own personality. You've got like, you know, the brash, you know, haughty adventurer, but then you've also got the power hungry one who's like kind of the same, but he's got like a different inflection to some of what he says. And then you've got like the really just effeminate you know one and and you can and you, but you can use the voice to kind of help along with everything else to create your character so i'm cool with that um i think it's a really interesting touch to make make your you know either your character or your party members being able to have their own voice so they're at least a little bit unique from one another like as, as I'm sure everybody has guessed by now, like in Final Fantasy 1, I've played with four red mages. <laughs> they're my favorite class. Um, and so if they all had like slightly different voices or if I could, you know, give one, you know, like a female voice or palette and be a female, I mean, that would be really cool to me. Otherwise, I've just got their names and I just have to pretend. <laughs> yeah. And that they're not all the same person, just times four. Yeah, so you have like the, the red mage at the front of the party is like, let's go. And then you have like a female red mage who, I can't do a girl voice, don't ask me to. All right! <laughs> and then you have, like, <laughs> right. then you have, like, we're going, hi there, let's do this! And, yeah. I would like so, that. So, look at this hero party. It's Red, Rouge, Rose, and, uh, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy is a converted red mage. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, so as far as, as far as voice voiceovers go for your uh, your your extra characters, I think that's pretty cool. I like that. I like stuff like that. That that allows you to use multiples of the same kind of character, um, but then have different personalities, you know, between them. Mm. That way, you can kind of self insert more onto those blank slates by just what little you have to work with. I guess I guess like just having a little bit is nice, because <laughs> then you can kind of like fill in the blanks. Rather than just having a full blank slate from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. A, a little goes a long way in that regard, because if you mm. have just one distinguishing characteristic, then you can build off of that mentally, instead of just having them all, you know, look the same and act the same. Right. Uh, I think FFT carefully skirts that issue of, of personality by, one, giving you 20 different classes to make your characters into, so... 
you know, no one is really going to be overlapping by late game. You know, if you, you have your one friend who's definitely a knight, one who's definitely a lancer, one who's definitely a samurai. And right. the, the, the other cool thing, which they shamefully took out of the PSP re-release, is the, uh, the casting quotes. Like, really? They removed those? It, that's that's what I read. They they took them out. So when you oh my casting, God, no. remind me what those are, I don't remember these. There's like a it's like a I don't even remember what the percent chance is, but there's a chance when you cast a spell that they have like a little quote. Um, oh, that that that. Oh, okay, okay. Because I I thought like by casting, I thought you meant you were interviewing them, and then they'll tell you a thing about okay. themselves. <laughs> oh no. Oh. No, I thought that's what it was. No, like uh, destruction of nature, gather in flame, that. fire, like like that. You know, they because the game will it, it's a percentage chance, but then it also recognizes when the opponent's about to die, and they go, "Hey, we're just gonna do this anyway." Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember that dramatic. Back. Yeah, just that extra little dramatic flair for the game, but it. I can't believe they took those out. I mean. I, I approve of a lot of the dialogue changes that I've seen. Um, of course, you know, some of the classic lines, just for nostalgia purposes, I should have left in, but they didn't. <laughs> but, but yeah, they, they do, like, as you were saying, though, they do kind of skirt that line by giving them that, like, little bit of dialogue. So if you are a caster, you kind of get that, that little bit from them as they do it. But it's all generic words anyway. Yeah, the... don't worry, Red Mage. I have a good feeling about this. <laughs> uh, th the best part about him, I think, though, is because it's always for some sort of skill. It makes it sound like you have to say it to activate the spell, so you can still have each character say it in a different way in your head. Right. That's true. Yeah. Now, see, to to kind of refute your your earlier point about having your character who's definitely this or definitely that. I mean, I'm not going to lie that, like, my final party ended up being, like, all the same class, all the same secondary, all the same reaction, all the same support, all the same movement ability. Because I had five teleporting, dual-wielding ninjas with zero faith, so they were immune to magic, and 97 brave and blade grafts. So. <laughs> that was, oh, that was way too much, but I loved it anyway. <laughs> You went that route? Because I went with the calculator route. Fuck, everyone had holy and anti-holy armor on. Ah, uh, it was great. Yeah. That's a neat way to do it, too. I never, I never really liked the calculators, only because I didn't like to have to, like, sit for each turn and be like, all right, what is the optimal use of this guy's turn? <laughs> all right, give me, give me five minutes to compare everybody's stats and then write down what, what looks like it's uh, going to okay. be the best. <laughs> Yeah, and I was a huge math nerd, so that was great for me. Oh, well, fine, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I think that's just the 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 final like skill for Final Fantasy Tactics because it's still the best game ever made, in my opinion. Because you yes. get as much out of it as you're willing to put into it, and that goes for brave faith, weapon damage, learning how martial arts and magic work. And if you've mastered all that other math, then Calculator is obviously the class for you, because you just love numbers so goddamn much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only pain in the ass is you have to actually learn all the other skills from every other class. Yep, and then especially oh, too, if you're, you know, real crazy, because then you can switch to Oracle, which has, like, one of the worst stat groans, and then hit the level down traps so that you level yourself down, but you only lose what you would have gained as an oracle, and then level yourself back up as another class to get better stats <laughs> overall. That's way too far for me, but a friend of mine is doing that right now. He's got two characters like completely maxed. Yeah, for stats. I remember that. That wow. is mad. Yeah, no, no thanks. He's already completed the game. Like He's done all the, uh, all the tavern missions. He's completed the Darkest Dungeon, or whatever it's called. The Deep Dungeon. Yep. Whatever it is. But, nah. But that's his absolute favorite game, and so that's, like, all he does in his spare time. Yeah, well, I have other games to play, so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no thanks. Yeah, yeah, my last FFT run was actually what I call an RP run. It was a role-playing run. I took... I had my friends, and I asked them what their birthdays were, so... 
I had as many people as I could ask in the game with their Zodiac sign and, like, their two or three preferred classes. So they were always, like, one of those classes with a secondary as one of the other ones. Hell yeah. Awesome. See, and that's and that's kind of why, you know, I mean, we could probably spend forever on FFT just because of everything that ha- that it does. And, I mean, because all, obviously all three of us play it in very different ways and get, <laughs> and get exactly what we want out of it, and it's all it's all about the side characters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah. All right. Uh, that does remind me, like, when I insert personality to my characters, it's always, like, it's this one sword master or this one mage. And it's really hard to do that when you have everyone as the same class doing right. the same thing. But see, like, it's it's cool with Red Mage because you can have one guy who only learns fire, one guy who only <laughs> learns lightning, <laughs> yeah, one yeah, guy yeah. only learns ice. Yeah, okay, okay. But like in my one, like the one, like there was one time I played uh, FFT and then like, ev- like, I refuse to have everyone, like, not be the same class because apparently having everyone as the same class boosts how much J- JP you get. Mm-hmm. So, so like, yeah, ev- like all my like Ramza plus every generic is always the same class. <laughs> so it's like everyone fucking use flare or everyone fucking use fire and whatever. Everyone jump at the same time, <laughs> and it was like, it's like really hard to for me to get into the the role playing aspect when everyone is the yeah. same class. Yeah, no. At that point, it's it's pretty much just just doing it for like the stat blocks and and doing it the most optimal way possible. It's because I'm such a nerd. Oh well, nah, it happens. I think that's about it. So, all right. So yeah, we're good. still doing that advice thing, huh? Yeah. So, kids, um, we haven't told you this for a while, but uh, pack your shit up. Your shit up. <laughs> Speaking of, I think I to- I think I mentioned this a while ago, but the game that I had made a while ago and I thought I had lost, I had actually backed up. As a matter of fact, so I have a copy of oh. it. And I can continue working on it. So I'm probably going to because this monster thing is not really meshing with me, man. It's really, it's really not. <laughs> uh-uh. So backing up oh, the wait. advice has worked for me. So. All right. Well, in that case, uh, thank you all for listening to the RPG Maker General podcast of the RPG MGP. Uh, this is Cody signing off. We'll see you all next time. I'm Blue Sky Robin. Thanks for having me. Red Mage? My god, we've lost him! Oh, shit, I was on mute. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what, what is the silence for? What am I waiting for here? Okay, alright. <clears throat> this is Red Mage. See you later. <laughs> but I was just like, like, like we, we said it, and I'm like waiting, and I'm waiting, and like nothing is happening, and I'm like, are, are we good, or... <laughs> Just like, red mage, come on! <laughs> oh, fuck. We got a man down! Clear! <laughs> I, I thought my net went down again, and I was like, oh no.